All right. Welcome to week nine. I hope you had a maybe restful week. Not sure how your schedules looked like, but I tried to accomplish absolutely nothing. And my goal was mostly accomplished. Um, today's lecture is going to be nice and short, which is why I wasn't worried about the fact that, you know, I might have been running late today. Uh, it's only 19 slides long. Uh, it's a very specific topic. And uh, probably be done in about 45 minutes. And then those of you that get to go home, get to go. Now, I'm going to warn you guys now, for the lab that goes with this, if you've got a Mac, you're on your own. Um, because I don't know, the commands are almost exactly the same as Windows and Linux. I don't know where your binaries are on your disk and you literally need to open up a command prompt to do this lab and type stuff in. So, you know, Mac users, please assist each other as best as possible. Uh, but I did warn you guys that right at the start of the term anyways. So, okay. So. We're going to be talking about backup and restore today, which is, you know, a topic that is uh, often very near and dear to database people, even more so than, you know, typical desktop support people. Um, as a person who's had his uh, backend saved multiple times, thanks to uh, back recent backups, I'm a big fan. So we're going to talk about what is actually a backup, what kind of backups there are, some of the strategies, and how you actually do a backup in MySQL. And we'll also talk about restores and how to do a restore in MySQL. So in case you guys don't know, a backup is a procedure to make a copy of your data. But I know that's a shock, right? Um, and the purpose is in case something goes horribly wrong with the computer. So whether it's your desktop or server or, um, see, I knew I should have waited an extra two, three minutes. Regardless of where the database is running, uh, it's a good thing to at least do a backup regularly. Uh, by regularly, I mean at least once a day. Um, strange things have been known to happen that can cause your database to just go poof, gone. And uh, yeah. So there is a lot of terminology when it comes to uh, backups. So there is a hot backup and a cold backup. A hot backup is a backup while the system is running. A cold backup is it stops the database server and then does the backup. Um, a full backup means it's backing up the entire database. An incremental backup is it's just doing a partial backup and then the differential backup. And we're going to talk about all these through the rest of this. Uh, the differential backup is a backup that just does the differences between one instance and another. So in a minute, I'll be talking about how these work. Uh, the backup window is when can you do a backup, like a window of time. And the backup jobs is what actually does the backup. Um, there's online, offline, and offsite. So an online backup is a backup that's live all the time. An offline backup is a backup that is available to restore from, but is not live. And offsite means it's somewhere else. So this is the offsite is all about the uh, fire theory. You got a database server running in your building and you have a backup. In the building, the burning building burns down. You lost all your data anyways because the backup's in the building. So you want to do an off-site backup so that at least there's a chance that wherever that backup is that's off-site probably will survive whatever event. Um, it was kind of entertaining because we, uh, at my day job, the off-site backup that we had was actually surprisingly close to our existing building. And when the tornadoes happened, they were actually using somebody's house as their backup location, one of the partners. And they basically had a permanent internet connection between the office and there, and we were doing the backups every night. And then they'd copy the backup from our building to his house. His house got flattened by a tornado when the tornadoes happened to whatever it was eight years ago. On the other hand, the office was fine. Now, if the tornado had hit both, 
we would have been screwed. So you know what the, the decision was? To just back up to the other partner's house, which was in Greeley. Figured, you know, 50 kilometers is enough distance as opposed to whatever else. It's just, you know, weird things about off-site backup that some people think it's a good idea. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, they could have. There's a bunch of things they could have used a data center for service or whatever. Uh, the, the implementation was very shortly after that was all our backups went to Amazon. So server runs in the building, backup goes to North Carolina. Really far apart. The odds of something happening at both places were pretty small. I mean, if it's catastrophic enough, take out Ottawa and North Carolina. But I think we had bigger things to worry about. So, you know. Uh, so there's data compression, data deduplication, deduplication and encryption. Uh, we'll talk about those topics in a moment. Okay. So the types of backups you can do. A full backup. A full backup is considered what they call a level zero backup. It's a complete copy of a partition. Now, in this case, people think partition because you guys are used to thinking about computers. Your computer has a partition. You back up your entire disk. Um, some database servers use disk partitions to store their files. MySQL does not. Uh, but essentially, a full backup is a complete copy of a database. You take the entire copy, you dump it, congratulations. Um, an incremental backup only backs up what has changed since the last full backup. Now, MySQL is incapable of doing that. Just telling you that now. MySQL is incapable of doing incremental backups because whenever you do a backup with MySQL, it does an entire dump of the database as a single file. Uh, there are tools to dump it as each table as a separate file, and then you can do an incremental. So it's a special tool you have to buy. You, the stuff that comes with MySQL does not have it right out of the box. I might be lying because it's been a bit since I tried doing backups with MySQL. Um, but so an incremental is only what has changed since the last backup. And then a differential backup, also known as a level two, three, et cetera, um, it only archives what's changed since the last backup. Notice it doesn't say the last full backup. So day one, you do a full backup. Day two, you do an incremental. So you only, what changed from day one to day two. Day three, you only back up what's changed from day two. So each day, the backups get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then on day seven, you do a full backup once again, and then you start that whole song and dance. So you got some fictional numbers here. So if you did a full backup, and then let's say your database was two terabytes, that's a really big freaking database. You'd have a <laughs> if you did a backup every single day, it's two terabytes per day. So if we do seven times two, that's fourteen terabytes a week of data. An incremental backup would be two terabytes on day one, one maybe one gigabyte on day two. On day three, it might be one point two gigabytes. Because it's basically the one gigabyte plus a little bit that's changed. And then the next one maybe 1.6, 1.9. You'll see it slowly grows. The backup slowly grows as it goes through the week with the incremental. On the other hand, the differential, you do two terabytes day one, one gigabyte day two. And then it's literally only what's changed every day afterwards. So then the backups will maybe, you know, 200 megabytes or, yeah, 200 megabytes, 400 megabytes, et cetera, et cetera. It saves on a lot of space. There's implications though with it. And the issue is if you need to come back to a fully functional database, you have to replay every backup from day one. So let's say it is Friday night, the backup happens, Saturday, the server melts down. What you end up having to do is you have to restore the full backup restore the incremental, and then restore each of the differentials one after another to bring everything back up to speed. Uh, which is why for a lot of smaller databases, we don't tend to do incrementals and differentials because it takes too long 
to get it back online. We do full dumps every day. I mean, at work, our biggest database is sitting at 16 gigs, I think, our biggest database. Uh, and that's got millions upon millions of rows in it and various tables. So a two terabyte database is very, very big. Um, so you, you know, more or less better off just doing a full dump every day so that if you need to bring it back, it's just one restore and a single restore is going to happen much faster than an incremental where somebody literally has to go drink my coffee. Is it done yet? No. Drink my coffee. Answer the phone. Oh crap. It's been done for 10 minutes. Start the next one on and on, right? Cause there's a human element in restoring these incrementals. It's just the, basically level zero means it's a complete dump. Level one is basically, the levels essentially correspond to number of days since the last full. So a full backup is level zero, also known as day zero. Incremental is level one because it's one day later. Level two is two days later. Level three, level four, level five. So I, all that's saying is that's how many steps there are before you can do a full restore to get back to wherever it was when it failed. Yes. Well, normally, so normally what you do is you time your backups. It's especially with things like MySQL and even Postgres, because uh, they don't really have good commercial backup tools for them. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle have very good third-party backup tools that can do differential backups and all that fun stuff every night. It all they're also very. Uh, I remember uh, Arc Save uh, when I used to work for Compaq. We had a license for, for one of our database servers, and it was $6,000 a year for the license. And that's in 1990, $1998. So you can imagine what it costs now for that same piece of software. Um, so normally what you do is you would time your backup to happen at, say, 1230 at night. It takes it, it dumps it to a file, and you know that the backup might take five minutes like a like the 16 gig dump for our big database takes about five minutes so system goes offline for five minutes every night and or used to when it was still in the building and then at 1 a.m we do a file system uh backup so that one does a differential of only the files have changed so then it only grabbed the backup file for that day Transmit it to the backup server. The backup server would also transmit a copy to the offsite backup. Currently, our database system at work is now running in RDS on Amazon, Relational Database Services. Uh, I literally, to do the backups for that, involves this. How many days do you want to keep backups for? 14, save. What's your window of operation? 2 a.m. At 2 a.m., it does a snapshot. It keeps 14 days of snapshots. So. If I need to go back three days, I can restore backup from three days ago, or I can back restore from yesterday. How long does it take to come back? Uh, I had to do a restore recently to recover some data that somebody did something bad. Um, by bad, I mean stupid. And uh, I think it took me six minutes to restore the database. And then it was copying data from one database to another database. But it took me six minutes to bring it, get myself a copy that was functional. So. When you're talking about backing up to a file with MySQL and Postgres, it's going to dump it straight to a file. You take that file and you copy it and you can use um, timed backup routines like rsync or, um, man, rdiff backup, I think it's called. It's a popular one for Linux. Uh, what that does, it keeps, what it does, it monitors the file system and any files have changed, it just does deltas. So it only keeps the little bits of change and it saves that to the server. So that in theory, you never, uh, so you restore the file system from its original snapshot and then you pick the other snapshot and it plays back everything else beforehand. So it, the software knows what to do with it. So depending on the size of your database, you may have to do one of these types of strategies. Now, ideally, we'd like to have backup everything all the time and keep it around forever right? You never know when you're going to need a restore of that database from seven years ago. 
Um, realistically, we can't do that because honestly, with most database systems, if it's more than seven days old and it's a it's a live system where you know data is changing, anything older than seven days is probably no good, anyways. So we, uh, oh my nose is so itchy, sorry. Um, so realistically, we can't do backups forever. Once again, even a 16 gigabyte database, 16 gigs doesn't sound that big when you got, you know, terabyte size drives. And um, I mean, my media server at home has 24 terabytes of storage in it. Six, I mean, four, six terabyte drives. Yay. And after a while, even that will run out of space. So you can't keep backups forever. So we need short-term and long-term strategies. So you should always have three copies of the data, uh, especially if you are self-hosting your database. Now, if you're using something like Amazon Web Services or Azure or you know one of the others that do these services, um, using their built-in backup tools is probably more than adequate because they their whole business is making sure your data doesn't go away and they're really really good at making your data not go away even when you want it to go away uh, just saying amazon knows way more about you than you know about you um same thing with microsoft but if you are self-hosting a database you want three copies of the data out of those three copies one should be off-site so there should be Theoretically, a hot backup. A hot backup is a database server that's live. So basically, you take one database server, you dump it, reload into the other database server immediately. So one is always a copy of the other. If you're doing a nightly backup, um, with a hot backup, you could also use something called replication, where the changes are immediate. So every time one database server changes, it copies the changes to the other server right away. Um, that is how we used to do things years ago. Uh, again, when I used to work for Compaq, we had a, an actual proper server room that was, you know, air conditioned and with the raised floors and racks and racks of computers, lots of wires. And we would have you know, three database servers, one in each rack. So if one of the racks went down, we had backups and we had the master unit where everything talked to, and it would replicate to the other two. Um, that was just a policy for that company. So that's just, you know, we had two hot copies for some unknown reason. Um, so that's the hot backup. So it's live, constantly up to date or as close to up to date as you can keep it. Uh, you have a cold backup. So cold backups are for what's called disaster recovery. Uh, my comment about the tornado flattening, you know, the person's house. That was actually our cold backups that got toasted that day, not our hot backups uh, or in building backup. So usually a cold backup is a backup that's offline. It's just a file sitting somewhere in a file system. It can be copied off site easily so that, you know, it doesn't, you don't lose everything. Um, and then, so you have one copy hot, one copy cold, one copy off site. Not everybody will do the hot backup thing because servers cost money, electricity costs money. Maintaining those servers costs money. And what's the most expensive thing in a server room? Anybody want to take a guess the what the most expensive thing in the server room? What what did you say? No. It's the person standing in front of the keyboard. Right? A good sysadmin who's actually being paid what they're supposed to be paid is $80,000 a year. How much does a good backup server cost? 10 grand? And it's good for three years, three to four years, if you're using the, the typical three year life cycle of you know, enterprise equipment. Um, server versus person, and usually you have more than one person. So, Taking that into account, I lost my train of thought completely. Um, so yeah, where was I going with this? Gone. 
It wasn't that important. It was just a nice segue. Um, so you have your backups ready to go. It's in the building. That's right. I was talking about having extra servers. Servers cost money. Um, a lot of companies don't like having a hot backup. They're satisfied with cold backups that maybe they do a dump three times a day. You know, 12 noon, 6 p.m., midnight, 6 a.m., something like that. So they only, at most, if something goes wrong, they lose six hours of data. And for a lot of companies, what's happening on the overnight is much less than the day. So, you know, at worst, you're going to lose, unless everything goes down at like five o'clock, you've lost maybe four hours worth of stuff. Um, and a lot of companies consider that acceptable risk. The So the other thing, though, is you also test to restore process. So can you switch over to the hot backup quickly? Um, often with that, it's just changing a DNS name on your local network, and suddenly all the applications can talk to the new database server because everybody suddenly, go, instead of going to 192.168.16.50, it's going to 51. But it's the same name, therefore, don't traffic just rest a new server. In the meantime, you unplug the old one and try to figure out what happened and make the old server become the hot backup instead. So you just switch which one's in charge. Uh, you want to try to restore from a cold backup. Um, as a person who once tried to recover a backup from, actually, this was a MySQL one, where somehow special characters were stored in the database and I couldn't get the restore to work. Um, definitely test restoring a cold backup, as in you do a backup of the database and every once in a while, you just try to restore it to your computer and see if it works. If it doesn't work, that means there's something wrong with your database or there's something wrong with how you're doing your backups. Uh, and you should also try to see if you can recover from off-site while you are on-site. Because maybe the server rack melted down, so your on-site backups are gone, on-site server is gone, hot backup is gone. So you pull out an old server out of the bin in the back, put it back in the rack, install the database software, and now you got to restore it from somewhere, and you got to try to get it from the offsite backup. Um, now, with the last one is others. What's cool now, and uh, most corporations are moving their data centers to the cloud, um, which is also known as just putting it on someone else's computer. Services like Amazon Web Services and uh, Azure have gotten very good at making sure you don't lose your data. I snarked earlier how you know they know more about you and they it's almost impossible to get rid of your data. It's not quite a joke. So, like I said, with our main system, it has 14 days of backups. It does a nightly backup. Administration's satisfied with that. It's good enough. Uh, our databases aren't that high transaction that it's that important. However, Amazon also has the ability, and so does Azure, to say, uh, I want you to have point-in-time recovery. So point-in-time recovery means I can recover at any point in time within a certain window. And um, we weren't prepared to pay the price for this, but we could set it up so that we can recover every hour. It doesn't do a backup. It actually keeps a cached copy of the database in memory somewhere else. So if we need to recover, we can just say, I want the version of the database from this time. And that's, you know, that's when it falls under others, that's when we start talking about cloud-based database systems where you don't have to worry about backups in the traditional sense, where you're dumping files to a disk and then backing those files up. They take care of the backup for you. So the strategies with them is significantly different than the strategies you would do if you had your own server sitting in your room. So part of the database administration tasks that people tend to have to do on a regular basis is obviously backup and recovery. So you need to make sure you always do your backups offline and you should always at least have an online one. Uh, for a while, what we were doing for an online hot backup was every night we dump the file, the file would get picked up by another server and then it would restore itself on the other server. And if the restore failed, it would email one of us, tell us, hey, the restore failed. So now we know that there's something wrong with our backup process. Um, and it's surprisingly really easy to do with a bash script. It would 
the servers were synchronized in time. The backup would fire off at 12.15 for the database server. 2 a.m. a cron job would fire off. It would SCP one file from one server to another server. Then we'd run the restore to it would dump it would drop the database, recreate the database, and then restore the database. The whole process might take 10 minutes. And then if there was any errors, it would you know, send a mail command from the command prompt. Um, recovery, you um, sometimes need to re restore the entire database. Um, you can also do restores for test or dev environments. So if you have a nightly backup, sometimes you'll want to grab one of those nightly backups, restore it into a dev server so that your developers have a very recent snapshot of the database structure. Uh, one of the databases that I work with on a regular basis, I grab a snapshot once a week from it so that at worst, I'm only, you know, seven, well, six days out of date from whatever's on the production server so that if they say something's been going on kind of weird, I can at least go look at, you know, what's happening with the data over time. Um, sometimes you want to recover missing or erroneous data in tables. Here's a real life Dan screwed up story. That happened about uh, a year ago. Uh, I wasn't very proud of that one. So in the morning, somebody reported there was a problem. I'm like, cool. How many cups of coffee do you think Dan had at that point in his system? None. It was 7.06 AM. Don't ever get Dan to work in a database without any coffee. That's rule number one. They learned an important lesson that day. So we have a registration system and there's something kind of cool about it. So when somebody launches the software, it connects to the server to register the software. What it does, it creates a, what's called a GUID, a globally unique identifier. And it tags that initial connection with that. So that if somebody's trying to hack our registration system, we tie the GUID to an IP address so that if somebody's trying to brute force the system and the IP address changes or the hardware signature changes, but the GUID doesn't, we know where they're screwing around with the packets, right? So I needed to replay somebody's transaction that was failing. Normally the command I do is truncate space, whatever table underscore GUIDs, which this is where stored. Dan that morning typed in truncate space, whatever the table called semicolon without the GUID part. And I truncated the configuration table for this system. Now, I'm assuming you guys know what truncate does, right? It nukes the contents of the table instantly. It just basically goes to the database server. The data is not here anymore. Uh, then suddenly, you know, tech support calls and goes, ah, Dan, uh, we got customers reporting that they can't register software at all. I'm like, oh, go to Amazon, do the restore. The good news was that none of these, none of the, this particular table had not changed because they were in the middle of trying to make changes and it wasn't working. Restore it to another place, dump the contents of that table and six other related tables because the trunk had cascaded and nuked contents of six other tables too. Built up, built up insert statements from that, repopulated the database. So the mistake took uh, one and a half seconds. The restore took 10 minutes. And uh, me fixing the data took two hours. Um, that is an example of that why you want to have a backup to recover missing data. Uh, it was not a particularly proud moment that day. Uh, yeah, don't ever do that. You shouldn't do that stuff on a production database at seven o'clock in the morning without any coffee. It's not good. It would have been better at 11 o'clock at night. I hadn't gone to bed yet. Okay, so I've actually this covered a lot of this kind of stuff um, as it is. So a cold backup is the easiest to perform because all you're doing is you're dump dumping the entire contents of the database as a single file, done. Um, it's good for stuff that doesn't change very often. Uh, it's good when the database, when users can tolerate a downtime. So, you know, you time it at two o'clock in the morning when nobody should be using the system. Because uh, what happens is you have to close off all the connections to the database server before you do the backup so that the data doesn't change while it's doing the backup. Um, MySQL, you can do a backup while it's live. And what it does, it locks it table by table. So blue, table A, it locks the table, dumps the content, unlocks table A, locks table B. Dumps the content at table B, unlocks B, locks C. 
Now, suddenly C depends on something in A and the contents of A change. Now, suddenly A and C are no longer in sync because it's slowly walking through the contents of the database server. Therefore, you tend to want to uh, make sure that nobody can use the system. So at night when this backup happens, you do it when nobody's using the system or you turn off connections to the database server. Um, for a lot of systems, that's more than good enough. Hot backups are significantly more complex. Um, it's suited for dynamic mission critical databases in the sense that uh, you, you need to keep things hot and live. Now, if you set up a clustered environment, that's that last point there. Uh, you can do a cold backup without loss of service. A cluster is a setup where you have multiple servers with all the same data on it and they keep each other in sync. So every time a record gets updated in one, the changes get copied to another, also known as replication. It replicates the changes. Uh, there's two kinds of replication. Um, there is the easy kind, which is read once, write many. In other words, there's a connection thing that pretends to be a database server. You ask for data, it just asks the next available node. But if you tell it to insert a record or update, it actually sends the insert command to all the database servers at the same time. So that is a read once, write many solution. Um, not the best solution. The other one are the kinds of things that Microsoft SQL Server has or Oracle has, IBM DB2 has. Uh, technically, Postgres has it, um, which is... Um, You know, they haven't made these words uh, politically correct yet. Master slave, that's literally what they're called. Uh, so you have a master database where that's live and transactional, and then you got the slave that gets a copy live. So every time there's a change, the slave gets it instantly. You gotta have multiple slaves. Um, and then there's another system called the multi-master, which is the hardest where each of the servers keep each other in sync all the time. So they're all live for everybody. Uh, banks, for example, use multi-master. Each of the branches have their copy of the data, but they also happen to have a copy of the data from the next two closest branches. So that each of the, if one of the branches of the bank burns down, the other branches have a copy of their data. Um, kind of cool. So a clustered environment, you can pick one of the machines to back up. It's not gonna affect anyone because they can still get at the rest of the cluster. So, where do we store these backups? Um, if you're going to store it on the database server, at least try to put it on a different hard drive. Just saying. Um, that is also something I've experienced when one of our servers where I wasn't in charge of, and it only had one hard drive in it. Period. I didn't even have a RAID. I didn't even have RAID 0. It was like straight up one hard disk. Not a SSD, you know, good old spin disk. And uh, one day the server stopped responding. You could walk past the room and you hear this clunk, clunk, clunk sound. You could hear it through the door. Drive was toast. And they're like, so do we have a backup of that? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's backing up to itself. Bruh. Disk is dead. Okay, well, we do have a backup from like three days ago. Okay, that's how, how much data entry is happening now. Um, so if you're going to use a server, at least try to do your backups to an other disk. Or even better, if you've got a server with a RAID array, make sure that the RAID array is in good condition. Um, and use at least, you know, RAID 0, if not RAID 5. 5 is much better than 0. Um, I don't know if they taught you guys about RAID um redundant array of independent disks that's what raid stands for and it's a tool for keeping your data um keeping multiple disks in a computer that serve their purpose raid zero is one copies to another raid one is known as a stripe so the data is spread across two disks without any redundancy raid five is a series of disks and there's some of the recovery data on each of the disks so if you lose one disk you can always bring it back by plugging a new disk in and it'll rebuild it from the other, what's left on the other disks. So if you are gonna 
keep a copy in the database server. At least make sure you have either a RAID array in there or you back up to a separate disk. Um, you'll definitely want to copy it to another server, whether it's on site or not, or you put it up to cloud storage. And there's a note here about you know using encryption. Yeah. Goes without saying, if your cloud environment gets corrupted, you probably want to have your crap encrypted. Um, back up the taper disk. That was that one makes me laugh because almost nobody does tape backup anymore. Um, but it's still a thing. Because you know, dollar for dollar, those tapes has the highest density for for the for each buck. Uh, I remember when I saw my first one terabyte backup tape. I was like in awe. It cost eighty dollars. How much does a one terabyte hard drive back then cost? You couldn't buy them. No, I even, even the military was using megabyte drives because they were tough. So I think if I remember right, the biggest drive we could get at the time was twenty gigs, and that drive would cost uh, close to a thousand dollars. So you know, density of dollar for amount of storage was great. Tape backup is slow as heck, though, and you know, a bit of magnetism would do wonders for data recovery, as in you weren't. Um, you tend to want to choose multiple locations as much as possible. Usually my recommendation is store to store on another disk on the same machine and send another one off to your cloud environment. Honestly, the cost of storage on Amazon is stupidly cheap. And same thing with Azure, that you have no reason to le not leverage their storage. Um, if I remember right, an S3 storage device on Amazon is uh, something like 10 cents a terabyte. It's, it's nothing. Like it's pennies on the dollar. Not even that, like partial pennies. So back up to the cloud. Even better if you can use a setup where they actually keep multiple copies for you. So a couple of clicks and it's, you know, mirrored to multiple regions. It'll cost you a couple of extra pennies per terabyte, but it's worth it. All right, so when you back up MySQL, what needs to be backed up? So content for full backups. So this would be a logical or physical backup. Uh, you'd store the log files for incremental backups and point in time recovery. Now, there's a way to do incremental backups in MySQL. It's really unpleasant. Um, I've only ever managed to get it to work twice. Every single time, the it was almost impossible to recover from it. Uh, why? Because the server actually was so fast that these incremental backups were useless. And you tend to want to copy the configuration information and any cron jobs. Um, yeah, consider using a source control system of some sort for your config files because sometimes you need to make changes and you realize you made a mistake. And we all use the world's most fancy backup system, right? My dot CN, CNF dot version one, dot version two, dot version three. Honestly, use an SC, uh, version control system, you know, whether you're using subversion or Git or whatever. Um, it's handy. Um, so, MySQL, did I just skip page? No, MySQL has something called a binary log. And the, the issue is, um, you have to turn it on. It's not on by default. So essentially, the binary log contains all SQL commands that change data. And or the data was actually modified, depending on how you, which setup you do. Um, it also contains extra stuff about how long the queries took to run. Um, it's stored in a, what they call an efficient binary format. In other words, it's a format you can't read. It's just a bunch of bits and bytes on the disk. Uh, you turn it on with a parameter called log bin and give it a file name. And they are created in sequence. 001, 002. And the binary log is transaction compatible. And it creates a Lindex file that shows you all what the what's in each of the log files. So the issue is, is that with these binary logs, you can restore from the binary logs, but you have to have, be able to restore first from a full backup. So you still have to have your full backup first, and then you can replay the binary log file by file. Um, 
if that doesn't sound like fun, you're right. It's not. Um, in a high transaction environment, for example, our primary database server at work, it's not MySQL, it's something else. Uh, it has upwards of a thousand insert update delete queries a second on certain tables. How big do you think these binary files would get with that kind of a setup? And MySQL is even worse. Um, so binary logs are cool. It allows you to do incremental backups. Um, there's a command called MySQL bin log, and then you run the commands and you feed it the files and it'll give you each of the commands that were run. So you can literally extract out of these files, each insert, update, delete in order that they were run. It doesn't store a differential backup in the sense that, hey, table A, column one was originally Bob and now it's John. What it stores is update table one, set name equal to John where name was equal to Bob. And that's what it stores. So if you're trying to recover from a point in time, it's literally going to extract each of the SQL statements and then run them one after another. And if you've got a system that's doing thousands a second, that can guess how long it's going to take to run all these binary files through. Uh, so binary log and point time recovery is literally a last ditch effort to try to recover things. But if you never even turned it on with that option to start with, you're toast. Um, so in MySQL, the, dead, the actual backup tool is called MySQL dump. So it dumps the content of the database. And what's kind of fun is that it outputs it to standard out. Um, Come on. We're getting there. You know, it would have been faster for me to just type it all in. There we go. Let's see. Oh. No, that's not right. That is running, isn't it? Yes. It's got password. I think. Oh man, do I not remember my password? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I got it set to no password lo to trust the local connection. Can't connect to the host. I'm trying to connect. That's interesting. Um, this is what you guys are going to experience when you do your lab, by the way. So I hope you remember your root password. What's stupid is I even did this like not that long ago, just to make sure I was ready for this lecture. Why is it not wanting to do it? Can't connect to MySQL server on localhost. Come on. P3306. Access to now. Oh, here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. P. There we go. So, here we go. I'm doing a backup. Obviously, oh, there we go. We hit some characters it didn't like. There's a good backup, eh? Oh, it's hung. 
So when you back up, it just dumps it to standard out, just so you know. So normally what you'll want to do is go uh, redirect to And now no error message. That's what this is talking about right here, that first line. So MySQL dump, name of the database. And by the way, that may or may not work. You may need to give it all the arguments and try to figure out which set of arguments it is you need. Uh, usually at a minimum, you need your username. And I've never seen it need a port before. Uh, but apparently I had to feed it a port number today. Uh, then you'll also include the, the uh, password if needed. And then you redirect the output to a file. So what does that content look like? Holy cow. This poor machine is so slow when I'm recording. And there's the con there's the backup. As you can see, it's just straight up good old fashioned SQL, because that's how MySQL does its backups. Other database servers do not do this kind of backup unless you tell it to, because it has its it has risks. Uh, MySQL is just special in the sense that it's the only way you can do it. All right, so. As you saw, it has create tables, insert statements, and um, you know a couple of other things. If you're running under Linux or Mac, congratulations, Mac users! You're you know same world as Linux users for this. You can redirect the output from one to the one command to the other command. So you can take the backup from and pipe it into it a restore right away. So you can literally just copy it to another server instantly. Assuming everything works. Um, so there's a few useful uh, parameters. Uh, dash single transaction uh, means that it'll when you back up the InnoDB tables, which are the ones you use for transactions, um, it locks the table and dumps all of those files, all those tables as a single process. Uh, lock all tables. Uh, that one's a really handy one. Um, basically, it doesn't allow changes to the database until the backup is done. So it basically locks the system so no changes can happen, and then it backs it up. Um, flush logs, it'll once it, the backup is done, it purges the binary log. So if you are using the binary log, it'll purge it so that you know you, you only have a day's worth of logs to worry about. All right, now for restore. There's only like three slides left. Um, well, a restore means you're recovering from a file. And so usually you'd restore from a file because, you know, server failed, et cetera, et cetera. You're making a copy of the database for development purposes. Um, or maybe you need to recover data, as I told you guys about my happy little truncate story. Um, that's another reason. And how you do a restore? You feed it from the file, literally. Um, I will go and do it. And if you're going to do uh, trying to recover from an incremental backup, it's MySQL bin log, and you literally feed it the binary files and you pipe it into My the MySQL. So it takes the bin log and it replays it command by command. Um, So now if I go, um, hey, so I just created a new database at the command line. You guys have probably seen the command, you know, create database, whatever it's called, in the, My, the MySQL prompt or in your design, your design tool or whatever. Uh, this is how you do it from the command line. 
And then I can go to my SQL command. And I'm going to feed it from, oh, that'd be bad. Hang on. And there's my backup. So I'm going to run this. And, oh, I'm running in PowerShell. Wait. Let me go grab this really quick. And I'm going to go. This is so dumb. I actually have to use the old command shell. I can't use PowerShell. PowerShell doesn't let me do it. So if I go paste. And it didn't like that. So what the heck is this problem? Uh, da -da -da. This order. There was something I didn't like. Hold on. Um, oh, a uh, duh. Eventually. It just comes back nice and silently. If I go over to MySQL Workbench, just show you guys that yes, that this did work. Uh, if I refresh this, you'll see here's my flight DB2. And here's my data from, from my backup that I just restored. Um, I will be posting the recording for you guys doing this lab. The lab is not terrible to do. Um, as long as you are literally just following the instructions, it's very take you by the hand and walk you through it. Um, and that, if I remember right, are, there's just a few commands you need to know. Uh, MySQL, you guys probably know about the MySQL command. Uh, did you guys do any of command line type MySQL stuff last term? So some people are going no, some people are going yes, and I got some people doing diagonals. So, some of you, yes, have opened up a command prompt and typed in the word MySQL. Congratulations. You did command line MySQL. Uh, MySQL admin allows you to create and drop databases. You did see me do that one in PowerShell. Um, this one right here, that last command I've got at the end. Can I make this bigger? Oh, PowerShell's so good. So you saw me do it here where that one was create. And if I want to get really fancy, I can turn around and say, there you go. Now I just deleted that database I did the restore on. So MySQL, the MySQL admin command is good for creating databases at the command line. MySQL dump is used to do the backups. So the combination of those three, you can do a backup, create a new database, restore into it. Once you're done, you can then delete the database. Um, kind of cool. And that's the end of that. So, well, that was it. <laughs> There's not much else to add to this. I mean, backups is not an exciting topic by any stretch of the imagination. And it's really not that hard a topic. It's, you know, you're making copies of your data and you're making sure it's not on the same machine. That's a backup. So outside of that, um, feel free to dive into the lab. Like I said, uh, Mac users, the only issue I can't really help you with is the fact that I don't know where the binaries are. So if you're able to open up a terminal and type in MySQL and it comes back with something, you're good to go. It just so happens that on Windows, MySQL doesn't put itself in the system path. Uh, that's, you know, and on Linux, it's always in the system path. So it's all good. Yeah, that's all you're doing is you're going to connect to it. You're going to back up one of the databases to a file, create another database, and restore it. That's the lab. No, no, the lab tells you which one to do. I think it's just the world database if I remember right. I think so. All right.